A new series now on BBC Two looking at the stresses and strains of being a dancer. Ballerina Deborah Bull asks, can anybody be a dancer's body? Dancing is what I do. For over 30 years, 20 of them with the Royal Ballet, it's been part of my life. I've spent most of my life learning to make dance look easy. It makes no difference what kind it is, on a stage or in a pool. For me, performance has to look effortless. But beneath the polished surface, my dancer's body is being pushed to its limit. performance in London it was on this very stage. I was 13 years old. Since then, I've danced in increasingly demanding ballets. My body's had to change to keep up. So how is my dancer's body different from yours? What skills did I have to learn? Or was I just born dancing? Can anybody be a dancer's body? I'm going to take you on a journey to find out what it takes to produce a dancer's body. A dancer needs to have exceptional balance and the power to jump high in the air. A dancer needs to be strong and flexible. And be able to spin repeatedly without getting dizzy. In the end, a dancer's body might sound like a superhuman body, but it's not. It's just a body. It's just like yours. Jumping is a basic human ability, but not everyone can jump like this. Le Corsair is one of the great bravura male solos. It looks effortless, but requires one specific skill. Rudolf Nureyev had it. Peter Schelfer's had it. And Tetsuya Komakawa has it now. The genetic ability to produce a great jump. The jump is the culmination of all the dancer's skills. No one has really studied the dancer's jump, but there's been a lot of research carried out on gymnasts. Hannah McGibbon is the British Rhythmic Gymnastics Champion. Today, we're meeting Professor Yanis Koutadakis to find out what produces a great jump. And I can demonstrate that to mm. Hannah. First of all, we have 
uh, the foot and mm -hmm. specifically the arch of the foot you have to have good strong ligaments mm -hmm. uh, okay. here yeah. uh, there you have to have good strong and long tendons and these three elements uh, have to work simultaneously to lift the body upwards so the structure of the legs and feet are really important in producing a good jump, but there's more to it than that. We're all born with a mixture of fast and slow muscle fibers. Fast muscle fibers contract more quickly than the slow ones. So all the best jumpers and the fastest sprinters need more fast than slow fibers. And that's just good genetic luck. All of us, we have some slow muscle fibers, we have some fast muscle fibers, but some of us have more of these or more of the other. We cannot change that. But what we can change, we can change aspects related to muscle training and muscle strength training. So what role does strength play in a jump? Uh, the greater the strength, uh, the better the result. But that's all in relation to body weight. And that is what we call power to weight ratio which means that for the same strength, uh, the better results are given by the person that have the lowest weight. Because the one thing we use in dance, which wouldn't get you very far in, in athletics, is illusion. Because we mm -hmm. uh, use the, the position of the head and of the arms to appear as if we're jumping higher, which I think plays quite a big part. I mean, Hannah, if you could try a jeté without arms and with your head down, let me say, it'll feel quite weird. Which is quite impressive, but do it, do it back again with, with a nice big head, big arms. There you go. See how immediately that she puts her eye up, her eye line up, the audience eye line goes up as well. To have any hope of performing feats like these, you have to start young. Each year, over 200 hopeful children audition for the Royal Ballet School, the place where I learnt to dance. After a rigorous audition process, around 25 11-year-olds are accepted, half of them boys, half girls. The school is looking for children whose bodies and personalities will be suited to the rigours of dance training. Throughout their time at the school, the students' progress is assessed. By their final year, at age 18, only about 15 of the original 25 will still be there. Grace and Ross are about to graduate from the Royal Ballet School. Over 10 years of training, they've developed their natural talent and acquired the skills necessary to set them up as professional dancers. So, in four counts, and uh, one, and... Uh, one of the natural abilities the school auditions assess is Let's flexibility. Go to the side. Show me as high as you can go without hurting yourself. Whoa, good, that's about there, yes, put it down, that's really good. Now, show me a grumbat, Mon. My goodness, that went to about there. That's almost double the height, isn't it? But, let me see, I think I can show you something here. If you don't appear your leg to the side again, now, if I just help you, now, let me, let me do it. I'm not hurting you, am I? No. Can I get it there? Now, can you, how, can you hold that? Whoa, <laughs> of course not. But you will be able to one day, because <laughs> I've done a lot of training, and I'm quite flexible. I'm not very flexible, I'm quite, and I can hold my leg about here, which is not bad. If you're really, really flexible, and you've had lots of training, it looks like that. When a dancer extends a leg past her ear, it's not just flexibility, good. it's also strength. <laughs> it's good, isn't it? Sylvie Guillem is one of the most talented, versatile and flexible ballerinas of her generation. My partner
partner here, Edward Watson, is a first soloist with the Royal Ballet. While Sylvie's one of the most flexible women around, he's one of the most flexible men. The secret of their flexibility doesn't lie entirely in their muscles, as you might expect. In fact, only about 10% of a dancer's flexibility comes from the stretchiness of their muscles. Eighty-five percent of your flexibility is predetermined at birth dictated by the architecture of your joints. If your joints don't permit this range of movement, there's no amount of stretching will help. The shape of your bones and the thickness of the cartilage is written in your genes. And that's something you can't change, however hard you train. If flexibility and jumping are mainly about genetics, a skill that's more about practice is balance. That heart-stopping moment in the Rosa d'Age, when the ballerina stands, unsupported, centre stage, is all down to hours of practice and nerves of steel. Balancing on point is almost equivalent to dancing on a high wire. A bit less frightening, but the area you're standing on is probably even smaller. Molly Saudek is a dancer who takes balance to extremes. She performs on a wire, about the thickness of a pencil and several feet above the ground. What kind of skills would you need to be a wire walker? I mean, what's the, the best genetics to have, for instance? I mean, height or...? No, I've seen all, all, sort, all body types do it, but it's, it's a particular kind of focus. Right and an awareness of your body. I mean, when you're on the wire, I can see that you're completely focused. Um, do, you, do you have to prepare for that, or does that come in an instant? What's difficult about it is, is finding the strength inside yourself to make the decision to stay on. Mm. And that, that's where the will and the focus come in. So can I, can I try this? This you is terrifying. It's like my first on. ever lesson on point shoes but five feet above the ground. It's a decision. I mean, to fall down at this height is not going to hurt you. <laughs> You're going to land on your feet. But you have to make the decision to stay on. <laughs> <Sorry. Wah! laughs> <laughs> Same step again. <laughs> Breaking out is not a lift. <laughs> I'm trying to stand still, but there's no way I can because balance isn't static. It's a constantly changing state. When Molly shows me how the fan works, I realize it's a magnified version of what's going on inside my point shoes. My feet and ankles make constant tiny adjustments, like the fan, to keep me on balance. Why wasn't I allowed to start with this? Because you need to understand how the balance works first, how your body works with the wire, and then you're in a position to understand what this can or cannot do for you. But those adjustments have to be so subtle that the audience isn't even aware they're going on. And then you have to make it yes. look easy. Not bad. That was pretty good. Like balancing on a wire, dance technique only improves through repetition. Unfortunately, too much repetition can lead to injury. Nilas Martins is a principal dancer with New York City Ballet.
Like all male dancers, he spends hours every day jumping. The pressure on his knee and ankle joints is tremendous. When the body lands from a jump, the joints absorb forces up to 15 times the body's weight. His ankle started to cause problems about a year ago. First it started with the swelling and then it became more and more painful, really, in the last year. Uh, coming down from big jumps has been a problem, you know, and, and sometimes it's just more painful than other times. Anyway, I did really, I think, finally I just couldn't deal with the pain anymore. And I decided I'm going to go have these x-rays taken to find out what, what is going on in there. Having tried physiotherapy and rest with no effect, Nilas went to see New York City Ballet's surgeon. It was his last option and his worst fears were confirmed. The x-rays revealed two bone growths called spurs in Nilas's ankle. When Nilas flexed his foot in a plie, a fundamental position for a dancer, the spurs rubbed together, pinching the nerve endings and causing excruciating pain. These are Nilas's x-rays. He has built up uh, spurs in the front of his ankle on both sides of the joint, on the uh, lip of the tibia and, and the neck of the ankle bone. And you can see in this plie view how these come together when he lands from a jump. Nilas dance is a type of uh, ballet technique known for big jumps and, and deep plies in landing. The male dancers who do that technique when they get into their 30s are prone to this problem. My ankle had been kind of chronically swollen <laughs> for about a year. And, you know, swelling it should only be there for short periods of time. And it's not something that should be there all the time. So I, I knew something was wrong. If you have a problem with your foot, if you're constantly compensating and favoring that foot, you're probably going to start getting pain in your back or in your hip. Once that starts, then you really start having problems everywhere and then you, you know, pretty soon you can't do anything. It, taking all those things into consideration, it makes it a lot easier to decide to have surgery. But with the obvious risks involved, surgery for a dancer is always the last option. The success of Nilas's future career hung on the outcome of an hour in the operating theatre. What we plan to do is to open up his ankle with a very small incision and look inside. We know about the spurs because we can see those on the x-ray, but there are often other things going on in there that do not show on the x-ray. And then by various means, we'll clean out the front of his ankle and take out whatever it is in there that's causing his symptoms. It may be uh, bone spurs, it may be some soft tissue scarring, it can be several different things. Dr. Hamilton takes the opportunity to check the general condition of Nilas's ankle, looking closely for early signs of arthritis. What I see is there's a small lip on the front of the tibia, just like it shows on the MRI, not very big. You look over all the way across to see his uh, ankle joint itself is pristine. Across, there's no scar tissue on. This is a crucial okay, point in the operation. Small. Any chips of bone left in the ankle joint could cause their own problems later on in Nilas's career. The spurs are carefully chipped away from the bone and removed. Now, what I want to do now, though, I want to take him over the side of the table and actually put him into a plea so mm -hmm. he's absolutely sure that there's nothing coming together. Perfect. And I 
Dr. Hamilton pushes Neelis's ankle into plie to check the range of movement now the bone spurs have been removed. He's relieved to see the movement is totally free. I don't feel anything now at all. We can roll him back flat now. The ankle is very clean, and usually these clean outs uh, work like a charm. It isn't quite as good as new, but it's close to that. So his prognosis is excellent. But the tension is by no means over. Neelis has a long period of rehabilitation ahead before he'll know if the operation was a success. It's now three weeks after the operation, and Nilas is in for his first session with New York City Ballet's physiotherapist, Marika Molnar. Over the next few weeks, she'll monitor his progress to find out how successful the operation has been. Dr. Hamilton has been very sweet in telling me that it'll only take about three months. Other people tell me longer. But in any case, I think I'm a fast healer, and I think that my desire to really get better is so strong that I think I'm, I'm going to do well coming back. Marika's role is not just to treat Neelis's ankle. She'll also help him get back to peak fitness, so by the time his ankle's recovered, the rest of his body will be ready to go again. And a lot of physical therapy is dependent on what uh, condition the dancer is in. In Neelis's case, he danced right up until the surgery. He was performing, and then right after the last performance, he went in and had the surgery. So he was in pretty good shape. Consequently, he's a lot easier to rehabilitate and stay and keep him in good shape so that as soon as this ankle and the lower leg musculature is strong and flexible, he could get back up there very quickly. It's now three months after the operation and Neelas is fully recovered and back on stage at New York's Lincoln Center. But jumping isn't just demanding on the feet and ankles, it impacts on the whole body. Okay. Ivan Putrov is a principal dancer with the Royal Ballet, about to dance the Bluebird from the Sleeping Beauty. Male ballet solos with these sort of big jumps don't usually last longer than a minute or two. This has nothing to do with creative choreography, or even with the dancer getting too tired. The limiting factor is the build-up of a chemical within the muscles called lactic acid. It's the reality faced by any athlete exercising at full power. Victoria Pendleton is a member of Britain's female sprint cycle team. Sprint cycling is fast and tough and produces massive amounts of lactic acid. At this rate, the longest she can keep going is around 60 seconds. It was fantastic watching you because it's not like anything I ever have to do. I mean, sometimes the guys have to do these quick solos where they burst out the stage and bounce around. It's not something so much women have to do. I can't imagine how you train for something like that. Well, the training mainly comprises of very short, intense efforts and plenty of them. I mean, the effort I did today was perhaps a bit longer than I would usually do to train for, for the sprint events, but lots of six to 12 second maximal efforts. Just six to 12 Maybe. seconds? Yeah, yeah, in some training sessions. And what do you do afterwards? Um, tend to collapse and have, you know, have to have quite a long warm down to get the lactic acid out of the legs. And sort of to recover, I have jelly legs after I finish an effort, you know, you just, you can barely walk. <laughs> I'm intrigued to know exactly how and when the lactic acid kicks in. So to find out, I'm going to warm up and then push myself on the bike over a minute or so. So, 
15 laps. 15 laps. Increasing each time. Yeah. So. A massive physical effort, like a cycle sprint or a jumping solo, requires such a sudden burst of energy that the heart can't beat strongly enough to supply oxygen to the working muscles. So the body switches to a different means of energy production, the anaerobic process. It's called anaerobic because there's no oxygen involved. The energy is supplied through a chemical reaction in the muscle cells. And the inevitable result of the anaerobic process is the build-up in the muscles of lactic acid. It's almost a minute now, and the lactic acid is starting to flood my muscles, blocking the nerve endings and leaving my muscles feeling numb. My muscles are feeling really heavy now. It's getting harder to push. This is almost my cut-off point. I can hardly keep going, and neither can Ivan. My legs feel completely dead, and although Ivan is still smiling, he couldn't have gone on for a second longer. Lactic acid is the reason why. So now I'm just gasping for breath, really, because I'm trying to get my heart back to its normal pace. And my thighs feel a little bit solid. I just feel like rocks, but I feel it mostly in the front of my thighs. Whereas when I'm dancing, because I'm standing, jumping around and taking all my body weight, I use many more muscles. Now I'm just using essentially the quadriceps and thigh muscles to power me forward and that's quite an unusual sensation for me. So I'm not used to feeling this kind of lactic acid in my thighs. Heavy panting after exercise helps get rid of the excess carbon dioxide and gets oxygen back into the system to recycle the lactic acid. <coughs> A very fit dancer or cyclist will be ready in seconds for the next burst. <sighs> And fitness is 90% hard work, like most dancing skills. It took years of hard work before I finally learned how to pirouette. The Royal Ballet's youngest principal, Argentinian dancer Marianela Nunez, is one of the best turners I've ever met. She's partnered here by another Royal Ballet principal, Jonathan Cope. Show me. Okay. What's the trick, Johnny? Are you actually holding her on balance, or is she on balance herself? Um, I think the secret is, really, if the girl can turn on her own, then in order to partner her, um, it's very easy. But if she can't turn on her own, then the secret is to get her straight and on her leg, and then the boy can turn her. But Marinella can turn very well on her own, so pretty much I'm not actually doing anything. I'm starting the turn, and she's just spinning in my hands. With a girl that can't turn very well, I'd have to push the turn round. So actually paddle? Paddle the turn round to keep it going. But do you give her a shove to start? A little bit of a shove show to start. Show me where. Hang on. Show, show me. Right. One hand here, one hand, just like turning a top. Okay, so you're... Like and obviously, the, the trouble is with doing that is that you can actually sometimes send the pirouette off. It's pushing to keep it straight. It's exactly like spinning a top, really. Try one more, and I give you probably too much force. Oh, okay, yeah. You actually pushed her sideways then. I pushed her then. off. Right. I mean, she was... Do you actually lift her up at all? <laughs> no, no. She does all that on her own, really. I mean, if she did a turn on her own, I'm sure it would be pretty straight. When Marianella turns, her body is almost perfectly vertical. It's what every dancer aspires to, and few of us ever achieve. Okay. I mean, it's, it's oh, yes. almost <laughs> there. Yeah. I could almost, you could almost let go. take your hands away, couldn't you? Yeah. Yeah. But everybody's different, and I think with some girls, 
It's, it's more like this. This time, just sort of releve and don't okay. turn. So it's more like... Oh, so you're rotating her. I mean, I can keep it going. <laughs> But why isn't she getting dizzy? The secret of turning is a technique called spotting. Focusing on a single point and bringing your head quickly back round to the same spot. Dancers are taught to spot from the first time they pirouette. It's second nature to us, but no one's ever explained to me exactly how it works. To understand more about dizziness and spotting, I've come to see neuroscientist Dr. Michael Gresty. Some people really don't like dizziness, of course, and that's what we're interested in, because when people get dizzy because of diseases, yes. then it's a very distressing symptom. If you sit in, it's perfectly safe. So that's, that's what you use it for, is for people who are suffering um, dizziness beyond the normal. Yeah, absolutely. Right. Right. Uh, if you sit back here, I'm just going to show you what we're going to do. Mm -hmm. What we'll do is turn around like this. And of course my head's locked in position. And your head's yeah. at the moment is going to be quite quite fixed. Right. And just see how strong the dizziness is without your ability to try to overcome it with spotting. So we can do it both ways. We're going to do it both Fantastic. ways. And we can also do it in the dark because this little camera here, which is going to record your eye movements, is infrared. Before we do this, Michael, what is dizziness? The strongest kind of dizziness we can experience comes from uh, malfunctioning of the balance organs in the inner ears. If we turn our head from left to right, the fluid inside the balance organs, which is very similar to water, it's called endolymph, um, tends to stay still because of its inertia. Just as when you turn the teacup around, the tea leaf still is pointing towards your lips when you're trying to avoid it. Now this motion of the head with the fluid staying relatively still stimulates nerve cells which project into the balance organ. And these nerve cells pick up this differential movement and feed a signal to the brain of the speed of head rotation in any direction you wish to name. Our balance is controlled by a group of tiny bones in the inner ear and the movement of fluid within the inner ear canals. Say you continually spin round and round and round and round, just like sort of spinning your teacup round and round and round. Eventually, the fluid catches up with the motion of the head mm -hmm. and moves with it. But then you suddenly stop. Right. If you suddenly stop, you totally fool the balance organ because the head stops, but the fluid continues to rotate. Mm -hmm. and this sends a signal to the brain that you're moving, but of course you're not. Right. And that provokes the dizziness. What difference does it make, though, to the amount of dizziness being in the dark? There's much more. Much more. Right. Because normally vision would suppress your dizziness because you can actually see the world is stable around you. But in the dark, of course, you've not got any cues to tell you that you're actually stationary. Right. Now, the reason we're going to record your eyes mm -hmm. is that the balance organs of the inner ears, yeah. when they're stimulated, cause reflex eye movements. If you turn mm. your head to the right, for example, yes. your eyes will automatically be driven to the left. So in the dark, we'll yes. see this. Yes, you get. So you're sort of you're naturally centering yourself. Absolutely. Right. Absolutely. Okay. So we can see my eyes, even though it's going to be dark in here. We're going to see them wibbling. Yes, indeed. Excellent. Now the first thing we have to do is turn the lights out and focus on your eyes. Okay. the eyes is what's called the stopping nystagmus, which is our external evidence that she's dizzy. So you stop me? Are you sure? Because I feel like I'm still going. Oh no, that's really weird because I now feel like the chair's going around to the left. But when, when we do the fouettes in Swan Lake, which is 32 fouettes spinning constantly to the right, Why don't we get that sensation? Well, that's in a sense is what we're investigating. I believe it's that it's under cognitive control. You know exactly what you're doing. 
you're the actor, you're not just a passive doll sitting in a spinning mm. chair, and you may be spotting. And although the motion has continual pirouettes, in fact there's a lot of complicated body movement in which you're slightly stopping, slightly mm. accelerating, slightly decelerating. So now I'm going to duplicate in the dizziness chair what Marianella is doing here as she turns. You can spot because you're going to make your head free. Oh, that's better. And we'll give Is you that... something to spot on. So you're going to spot on a little light okay. that we've rigged up. The comparable thing would be if you choose... What do you choose as a dancer? A spotlight in the distance? We have, uh, um, wings yes, or no, spots, a, a tiny light at the back of the auditorium. Or those exit signs are very good, yeah. actually. So yeah. you, just, you just pick something you, you can see. And if you can't see, you, you make the head movement anyway. So the spot will always be audience-oriented? Always, okay. yeah. Pirouette, I leave my head to the left as long as possible and then flick it round to the right to spot the same point. This flicking, left to right, means the fluid in my inner ear can't build up momentum. My brain doesn't realise I'm spinning. And that's how spotting works. Now you wouldn't do many more pirouettes than that, so no. we're going to come to stop now. How's the dizziness? No dizziness at all. It took me just a nanosecond to go, oh, okay, we've stopped. Yeah. And no dizziness at all. The classical pas de deux, like Don Quixote, demonstrates all the skills we've been exploring. Jonathan's jumps, Marianella's turns, flexibility, balance, and strength.
Most of my performances have been on the ballet stage. But two years ago, I shared a stage in New York with a dancer who did things with his body I've never seen before. I don't know how it happened. You know what I'm saying? I never expected to become a dancer. I wasn't sitting around with my crutches and brace when I was nine years old going, I want to be a dancer when I grow up. You know, I just, that wasn't there. Bill Shannon was born with malformed hip joints, making it difficult for him to walk unaided. Looking at my work, there's a lot of ambiguity in my need for crutches. The disability that I have, leg calf perthes disease, basically it means that the hip isn't round it's like a square peg in a round hole. If you use it too much, you're gonna be in severe pain. If you use it a little bit, you can deal with the pain. But if you wanna be a dancer, you cannot dance without using crutches with a square peg in a round hole. Bill started out as a street dancer, part of New York's hip hop scene. Over the last 10 years, his unique style has attracted invitations to perform all over the world. Sometimes I'll end a show by lifting up my crutches and walking backwards for like four steps as the light fades out. And I don't really do that to show that I can walk. I do it to basically ask the audience a question. And that question is, if you have in your head that there's an absolute representation of disability, then you're wrong. Bill distributes the weight of his body across his arms, legs and crutches. It's a six-limbed style unique to his unique body. Bill's crutches are as fundamental to his performance as these are to mine. People always want to know whether dancing on point hurts. Well, the answer is that over years and years of training, the body changes and strengthens to adapt to almost anything you throw at it. So while dancing on point hurt when I was 11, these days I'm as comfortable on point as most people are in bare feet. <laughs> Ah! 
Given enough time and the right training, the human body can adapt to the demands of all kinds of dancing. The French company, Montalvo Evier, blend together several dance styles and different dancers' bodies in their performances. And today, I'm going to join in, playing the role of ballerina with break dancers, an African dancer and a contemporary dancer, all on stage at the same time. Different dancers, different bodies, celebrating what the dancer's body can do. The physical skills involved in dancing, however extreme, can all be explained. It's either training or genetics, or usually, it's a bit of both. What goes on in the mind is not quite so straightforward. In the next program, I'll be exploring what lies behind it all, the dancer's brain. joins Edwina Curry tonight from 10 on 909 and 693 BBC Radio 5 Live. Next on BBC Two, Reputations tells the story of one of Britain's favourite comedy actors, Arthur Lowe. Deborah Bull is logged on to BBC I now. If you'd like to ask her anything about her series Dancer's Body, go to bbc.co.uk slash dancer's body.